Welcome to Bonafide Dialogues with Christina Cuppers. Explore our three segments, legal tech, creativity, and paradigms and paradoxes. Connect genuinely, brighten your perspective, and share your passion. Patty Sobin is an artist skilled in sculpture and oil painting. She holds an associate in arts degree with an emphasis in sculpture from Chabot College. As a lifelong resident of the San Francisco Bay Area, her art has been featured in galleries and exhibitions across Northern California. Welcome to my podcast. I'm so excited that we finally found time to get together and talk about art and sculpture. Welcome, Patty. Thank you. Yes, it's been a while trying to get us connected. So yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you. I really love your background. And why don't you tell us about it a little bit? The, this art is amazing. Oh, well, thank you. I'm trying uh, to focus on you, but I can't <laughs> help but look and see your background. Thank you. Yes. So um, I, as an artist, I think it's really important to continue to learn from, you know, more experienced artists. So uh, this larger um, sketch here is actually one that I did in a, in a class that I took. Um, and uh, so it was a, a homework assignment or, you know, an assignment that we did for that class. And it's actually a drawing by a very famous artist named um, John Singer Sargent. And he's well known for um, his portraiture. So, you know, I think also copying or, you know, looking at other famous artwork and, and trying to convey their same style is something that you can learn from so that's uh, that's what that is and then the smaller one here is um, a painting I did of my husband's great aunt um, she passed away a while ago but she was a, a beautiful soul and so I tried to capture that in this small painting here this is beautiful so beautiful thank you, thank you. How did you first discover your passion for sculpting? Uh, so when I was younger, I would say some somewhere in elementary school, I'm not really sure uh, what age I was at the time, um, I was given a small bag of clay um, from my grandparents. I don't exactly know where the clay came from because none of my grandparents uh, were into art or into sculpting. Um, but I was able to use this clay to form um, the head of a dog. And at the time we had a German short haired pointer. Um, so I modeled it after him. And I really loved it. And I thought it was such a great creation, but I have no idea what happened to it or, or <laughs> what my grandparents thought of it if they found it. Um, but uh, so I think that really is where my love of clay started, my love of sculpture. Um, and then just moving forward in life, I just always felt like I was drawn to sculpture. Um, I'd taken, you know, some painting classes and uh, uh, drawing classes, but ultimately um, sculptures where uh, I felt this pool. Um, so definitely when when I had the chance to take those types of courses, you know, that that's definitely what I went for. Yeah, it seems like uh, most of our passions have their roots in our childhood. You know, I made sure that I exposed my children to different forms of art and I also took them for two years to um, the Spider Studio in Berkeley, Kids and Clay, and they loved it. I don't know if they ever will do it as anything, you know, related to it and they become adults. Um, but I think it's wonderful, wonderful for their brain development, uh, wonderful for their creativity. So that is such a beautiful story. 
Oh, thank you. Yeah, I agree with you. I think it opens up their imagination to you know see what else they can create. So I'm glad you did that for your children. Thank you. Um, and could you please talk a little bit about your creative process? Uh, I know you said that as a child, your first piece of art uh, was a dog. And I know that you have two beautiful dogs and uh, they're probably a huge inspiration for you. Yes, definitely. Um, well, I guess the creative process can start with, uh, you know, inspiration. Um, it could be just, you know, looking at your dog, as as you're saying, or, uh, you know, a moment in time or, you know, just something that you find beautiful and that you want to capture on uh, either a canvas or, you know, clay in a, you know, 3D form. Um, and I think, you know, when when I think of something or something comes to mind and I want to capture it and I, I think, you know, this would be really great in this art form or that art form, um, I will try to note it down. Um, I have a sketchbook that I keep around. Actually, I have multiple sketchbooks um, and I just try to sketch out my idea. And a lot of times, um, you know, you get that drive when you get that first, you know, uh, thought in your mind of this sounds like something I would love to make or I would love to see in art. Um, you have that drive to just start right away and, and get into it. <laughs> so I try to capture a quick little uh, drawing of it and then I might start making it. So if we talk about um, clay, for instance, um, in my drawing, I might start with uh, the drawing and then build some sort of um, structure underneath. Uh, you know, just draw it out so I know what it, what kind of structure I need to build for that um, specific sculpture. Uh, so then once I'm getting it together and I'm building it and I'm seeing how it's coming to life, uh, I might, or I will continually take progress photos, both starting with that armature and then as I'm packing it with clay. Uh, and those progress fo photos are very important to me and to my process because um, it's a great way to like step away and get a different view of your mm. artwork. Um, a lot of times when you're really close to that artwork, you're seeing it, you know, only at th that view and it might look a certain way. You might think, oh, this is looking great. I'm doing such a great job. But if you step back or look at it mm -hmm. with a clear eye, maybe look at it the next day, you might say, oh, actually, this shoulder is too high. Or, you know, you might see little things that you want to change. And a lot of times it's not just um, it's not just the details of, you know, maybe the 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 um, the structure of the that piece. It can be that I want to just change it all together. Maybe it was a standing piece. And I think actually I'd rather it be seated mm -hmm. than um, a lot of times I might take that that photograph, put it on my iPad, draw right over it with, you know, some um, one of these apps where you can use, you know, your pencil on there. And I might redraw, you know, the legs or redraw the arm in some fashion that I think might be better suited for um, that specific sculpture. Uh, that's that's interesting. Let's step back a little bit. Then yeah. something you said in the very beginning uh, that is something I have been thinking about um, for a while. You said then you see something beautiful, you get inspired. Does every every art has to be beautiful? Not exactly. That's an, that's but an interesting it, it, question, right? <laughs> we always think about the art as something that is so pleasing and so beautiful. You look at this piece of art, you look at that piece of art, piece of art and you think it's amazing. Uh, but lately, I started uh, thinking about it from a different perspective. Maybe not always it has to be something beautiful. I th I think what we're looking for in art, it's ultimately the feeling. You know, if if you feel something, then you look at that art, it's not necessarily beauty, right? It can be something is that conveys some struggle that you look and you feel sorry or you feel pain or 
So I know it's most, most of the times uh, we get inspired by beauty and because by love and positive emotions, but so often in life, you know, good piece of art can be not something that is just aesthetically close to perfection, right? Let's make it more beautiful. Let's make it more perfect. Let's look into every detail. Does it have to be beautiful? Or <laughs> this is an interesting, like more philosophical uh, question, but what do you think? Um, I definitely, you're right. It doesn't have to be beautiful, but again, you could say beauty's in the eye of the beholder, right? Um, there's some work that you might find to be a little bit grotesque. There's a, a wonderful artist, young artist named Erica uh, Sonata, I believe. And she makes these, what I call beautiful sculptures that are just these grotesque figures of, you know, it might be a dog and he's got this bird that's growing out of him. It's just mm. so weird and interesting and, you know, makes it, it might give you a weird feeling because it's not real but they are so lifelike and in my mind beautiful but her coloring I think is amazing and so I can appreciate her because I can see or I can imagine what it takes to build these and um you know as as I said like I don't think everybody would think of these as beautiful I think people would see these and say they're incredibly creepy but to me I find them beautiful I I see what it you know how um just the forms that she makes and the coloring that she does and mm -hmm. I, I just I very much admire her work mm -hmm. and people have different opinions about beauty too there's a standard Correct. general standard um, but it's very interesting how people perceive beauty and again all of that comes from your childhood somehow anyway yeah very very interesting uh process so it starts with kind of inspiration so I want to say that um a, an artist that you know I've really admired basically my entire life is uh someone like um Bernini who was you know from the Baroque era and I loved I love his sculptures because there are a lot of them are made out of marble and I love that he creates these figures that you know are out of this really cold hard stone but they look so soft and you know like that flesh is flesh and and it's just beautiful it's amazing um I find inspiration or I found a lot of inspiration mm. in looking at those types of sculptures and in the beginning um you know, when I was much older and looking at uh, actually learning to do, learning to make um, sculptures, that's what I was looking towards uh, or looking for as looking at as an inspiration. Um, so you can be inspired by somebody or someone in, in your everyday life and your surroundings, but you also can be inspired by amazing artists. Artwork, right, right. Or artwork, yeah. Right. So um, I will say that when I had the first chance to work in marble, I took it. And mm. that was the first course I took in um, my first year of college. And I loved it. It's it's hard work, um, but you can produce, you know, some beautiful things. Marble is beautiful. Um, you can always, you know, there's uh, different types of marble. Um but it is one of those things that's difficult. You would need a lot I of I can't space. even imagine. It's so yeah. hard and tools. <laughs> and you need all the tools. One little yeah. mistake can ruin it all. And I was looking at the different types of materials uh, that are used for sculptures. There's like stone, metal, wood, clay, um, glass, and just some other objects very interesting I know you're focusing on clay um, but as you said marble uh, it's a, a di very difficult <laughs> very difficult material to work with uh, did you try any other um, materials oh yeah stopping? definitely mm -hmm. um, I will say that when you do 
well, when I was learning to st st sculpt with marble, um, we did start with a clay um, sculpture, a, a maquette made out of clay. So I first built it in clay and then I tried it in marble. Um, but that's what uh, that's what I uh, found interesting that even though you can work with so many different uh, materials, uh, the clay clay it's it's the first step you take before yeah, like you even foundation. create. Yeah, it's a kind of foundation. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, so um, I also tried some uh, metal work. Um, uh, I have a couple that I did some bronze casting, which um, you form your pieces. Well, at least the pieces that I did, I formed out of wax. And mm -hmm. then we did that bronze casting. And then I have some that I um, created out of sheet metal. So just pounding that sheet metal, getting it to shape to to be that shape or form that you know you're looking for um i did take a little bit of welding to you know weld the pieces <laughs> together but um i think uh what ended up happening at the end of that course of taking that class and working with metal um i never ended up welding my pieces together i ended up having my my father do that since he's a <laughs> professional welder mm. which is really nice you know if you sure. are um an artist and your focus is maybe in this one section um sometimes it's nice to reach out to other artists to get uh you know that finishing touch that maybe you don't have as much um experience with skills, yeah. yeah i i notice it a lot with let's say bronze casting a lot of artists will create their piece they might make it out of clay they might make it out of wax they send it to that bronze caster so that that bronze caster is the artist that's actually casting your piece and they um they will have a person on hand to do the coloring which is a whole mm -hmm. nother realm of you know an artist like that's uh, you know something I have no idea how to do but you know they help you with capturing your vision oh that's wonderful very very interesting we mostly focusing on clay but you try different uh, materials I especially find interesting uh, glass sculptures uh, that is such an interesting uh, form of art as well it looks very, very exciting <laughs> and fun. It looks like a fun thing to do. I've never tried um, uh, glass, though. Hopefully yes. How someday. How about the size? Let's talk about the size. Tell me about the pieces of art that you may be currently working on. Are they all small or large? And if they're large, what was the largest piece that you ever created? Uh, so... I I think I have a preference to work large, mm. um, not not massive, just like yeah. a, a larger size piece that might be a little too heavy to carry. Um, mm -hmm. But that's, you know, it's very difficult to do that because, like I said, it's a little too heavy to carry. <laughs> and and uh, materials only... probably expenses too, right? It would yeah, so, um, cost a lot to create a big piece. Definitely, definitely. So because I like to work in clay, that means my piece would have to be fired. It's not something I can do myself. Mm. Um, and then, you know, you would need a larger kiln um, to mm. fire a larger piece. So then yeah. you're paying for that. And also, depending on where you're taking it to be fired, um, right mm. now, I'm only taking it to a place that has specific electrical kilns. Um, so you can sizes. you can have I, your vision, you can have your desire to create larger pieces, but you can be limited by it's right resources, it's right? Right, exactly. Yeah, that's uh, that's interesting because I would love to see a, a beautiful art everywhere we go. You know. discussion about your creative process so we started with inspiration uh, which can happen anytime anywhere and you can get inspired by 
people in your life, by object that you see, uh, and you can uh, get inspired by talented artists, other artists, or some other art. So the next step, uh, when you got inspired, you said that you you need to do a little sketch, right? And uh, it's kind of planning a project management <laughs> approach. What's the next step? If you could just take a little bit more time on explaining uh, your creative process, that would be wonderful. I think everyone would really enjoy that. Definitely. So again, you know, starting with that sketchbook, um, after that, that's kind of like your plans. You're building your plans, you know, your blueprint for what you're going to make. Um, sometimes I might draw it in different angles because it is a 3D um, object. So you can't see the full thing from one side. So that that's something sometimes I do consider when I'm sketching it. And then um, if it requires an armature, I'll build that. That might be also sketched in the, the sketchbook so I know what mm. that armature should look like. Um, because I do work in clay, I don't always build hollow from the start. A lot of times an armature is required for uh, one of these pieces that is not hollow. Uh, it's much easier to build something when it's not hollow. So I might pack that armature with um, anything I have around, um, let's say plastic bags, uh, mm. newspaper, just to bulk it up before I put the clay on there. Um, and then once I get the clay on there, I'm kind of sketching out that that piece that I'm trying to create. So um, I don't want to start putting details in right away. And I know you uh, said you take pictures so you can look at this right. uh, piece from different angles and kind exactly. of from the outside viewer perspective, right? Exactly. So that's the next step. And, and then you have the shape in place then you get into details that I love the details part it's like you really that, need to be an amazing artist to capture those little things and in my mind uh, little things matter so much could you please yeah, talk about the details a little bit I, I will say that sometimes the details are the more exciting part of uh, building the sculpture or even a drawing. A lot of times you might see a, an artist who goes, starts drawing maybe a head and then goes right in and really gets that eye to look really realistic before they really have finished the face and putting the placement of everything. Um, and that's something you need to or might want to avoid um, in case that eye really is a little too low or too high. It's mm -hmm. the same thing with sculpture. You kind of have to work your way. Um, let's see. Like overall, uh, right? Details. Right, right. So. Uh, <clears throat> Unless you, that eye is a centerpiece <laughs> and the main idea, right? It doesn't matter if it's. <laughs> right. It depends on what kind of piece you're going for. Mm -hmm. So that's true. Um, but either way, the whole entire prop process, I am taking those photos. I have my piece on a turntable. I'm turning it. Sometimes I'll even do a video of just turning the whole thing. Um, and I might, while I'm there, look at my picture and, and see something that I'm not seeing just from it being right in front of me. Or I might, um, you know, cover it up go, you know, go back home and, you know, that night, maybe look through the pictures that I took and see what my progress was and decide. That, that night, but do you have like a sleepless nights? Like, ah, something <laughs> is not it, you know, it's something, I don't know what it is. You know, I, I won't say that I have sleepless nights, but there are times where, you know, I think, oh, this is what it needs and I'll do it. And then the next day, you know, think, actually, that's terrible. That's not what I want. That's not what I was looking for. Let me put this over here instead. So, you know, it's really a great tool to keep looking at your progress and decide, you know, what you're going to do next. And sometimes I might take what I've learned from those photos and my ideas and go back to that original sketch and either redraw it or mm -hmm. add a piece to it that wasn't there before. Um, How long can it take for you to create your piece from the beginning to the end? There are some times where I have taken very long on a piece, but that wet clay uh, 
portion of the creation. I try to minimize how long I have that because, you know, it starts to dry and then you can't work with it as well. You need to rehydrate it to keep working with it. Um, when it's I'm actually really feeling, a pretty fast, right? It just... Uh, well, well, when I'm feeling really inspired, I might really work the clay fast and just be really excited about it. Um, but there are times where, you know, I may not have the time, so I might start it and then I have to wait a few days because I, you know, I'm too busy with mm -hmm. regular life, <laughs> you yeah, know, as so it is for most people. Yeah. And then I, you know, I come back to it. A lot of times that, that makes it a little more difficult because you might lose that, that spark that you originally mm -hmm. had. Um, so sometimes it's a little difficult to jump right back in. It might take me, you know, playing with it a little before you know it comes back but it usually mm. will come back which is nice um so back to the process um once i'm at that point where you know i'm getting close to putting those details on um because i'm not building hollow from the start unfortunately i have to cut the the piece in, in sometimes just in two other times in several pieces depending on what that sculpture looks like um, <clears throat> these are just judgments you have to make uh, on your own while you're building that piece according to the way it looks because you don't want to so cut So why through. do you have to cut it in, in pieces just for somebody who is completely yeah, unaware okay. of the process? If you could explain it. Of course, of course. So um, any uh, clay sculpture needs to be fired and you can't fire anything that is um, really, really thick because mm -hmm. there could be air pockets in there or um, steam could get trapped and that can cause your piece to explode mm -hmm. yeah. in the kiln. Um, sometimes, you know, it, it sounds crazy. It's like, oh, the whole thing explodes. That won't necessarily happen um, if you, you know, if you hollow it out. But sometimes if you get air pockets just within the clay, you might have a little piece that pops off. You don't want that to be like the eye or the nose or some, you know, some beautiful yeah. detail uh, like that. So, uh, so I do have to hollow it out and make sure that most of it is uh, uniform in thickness throughout. Mm. Um, so that, that would be the next step, hollowing it out, and then you have to put it back together, which, you know, I think that whole process of pulling it apart and putting it back mm. together is really, can be terrifying. Yeah, because I you just build imagine. something. Yeah, just... Right, and you have to take it apart. <laughs> um, I do have some photos of, you know, a sculpture I built where I had to take it apart in several pieces. Um, so I have all these pieces lying on my table where yeah. I was hollowing those pieces out. Um, having originally packed that uh, that structure, the um, you know the interior structure with that plastic bags that I said, you know all the things mm -hmm. that you would put under in there, that helps. So you're not having that be clay. That's you know parts that basically when you cut it out, it's already hollow. Mm -hmm. um, but you do need that step of making sure the thickness throughout yeah. is pretty similar. Um, so then you put it back together. Uh, and then th there's the process of trying to hide that seam. It it can be difficult. <laughs> there there are, you know, some technique to make sure that it, it's as smooth as possible. But once you do that, that's the best time to then um, add those details. Because if you were to add some beautiful, you know, small detail like the eye again, for example, um, it could be that when you're pulling them apart, maybe your thumb goes on that eye Aww. and you lose that detail. <laughs> so it's better to do it later um, so that, you know, your detail stays and uh, you can appreciate your art uh, as it is without, you know, messing Destroying. anything up. Right, right. <laughs> um, the process. Yeah. Then there's that uh, time that you need to let it dry. Uh, um, we don't ever want to fire anything that's wet because that um, water in there will turn into steam and could cause that piece to explode in the mm. kiln again, uh, which is something you want to avoid, <laughs> obviously. Um, so as you're letting it dry, some artists do find that there's other details that they would prefer to do when the clay is a little drier, not mm -hmm. fully dry. Um, sometimes it's easier to do some etching in there, uh, which, you know, depending on what you're doing, it could 
it's a really it's good, great details that you can be adding. Did do any of that etching into that leather hard clay. Um, after you're done with those details, you would let it dry even further so it gets into that bone dried state. Um, once it's there, it's ready to be fired. You can then put it in the kiln. Some um, artists use gas kilns, some use electrical kilns. Um, you fire it. And then after that, you can put a uh, glaze and un well, under glaze first if you are going for something brighter or more colorful under glazes tend to be more colorful. Um, you can add that glaze on top to really brighten that sculpture. Uh -huh. You have to fire those those colors on there um, and then you have, you know, your final piece. Wonderful. It seems it sounds easy, but at the same time, I know how complex it is. And there are so many skills you need to have in order to create a beautiful piece of art. Can you tell me uh, about uh, your teachers? Where did you learn all this? When I decided to go to college, I did go to a, um, a, a junior college. Here in Hayward, I went to Chabot, where I was lucky enough to uh, learn under Clayton Thiel, who's a magnificent artist. Um, I feel like he knows everything you need to, need to know about sculpture. He works in um, in clay, so ceramics. He also works in uh, in marble. So I actually went to him first to learn that marble, and then you know the clay from there. And I kind of just stuck with clay because it's mm -hmm. so much easier. I was able to do some things at home and then bring them into class and continue the process. Um, but yeah, he's he's an amazing artist who still creates artwork and he tends to make uh, really large pieces. Um, I feel like every time I go and I see his work, I'm still you know learning something and can see something new and and it's really nice to see you know his work and how it develops. So the sculptures, like any other art, usually convey emotional messages. And uh, could you please share with us a piece of art that really holds some significance for you personally? Uh, yes, definitely. Um, I did recently, well, within the last two years, created a sculpture that really I hold near and dear to my heart. It uh, was a sculpture I actually made out of, um, it's a different type of clay that you can bake in the oven actually. So it's really nice. I was able to create the whole thing here within my house and I didn't have to take it to a kiln, um, but it's a sculpture of my dog who passed away. Mm -hmm. um, I actually created it to be an urn so it's a functional art and it looks just like her. It's in her likeness. It's a tad bit larger than life. She was just a, a very mm. small dog. Um, and, you know, it just, it's very special to me. Oh, that that's wonderful. That's wonderful. And maybe, uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about uh, the art shows that you participated in in the last year. And what does it take uh, to prepare for uh, for one? Oh, definitely. Uh, so it's all, it's very important for you to know what galleries are you know you're interested in showing in to know what kind of art they're looking for. I think different galleries are looking for different types or specific types of artwork and you know it could be that maybe your artwork doesn't really fit their aesthetic so that's something to think about. Um, the shows that I've been in, uh, part of, I've been looking for their um, call for art. And a lot of times in that call for art, it tells you exactly what they're looking for. There's a theme to the show. Um, they're looking for artwork that fits that theme. Um, it might say in there what size uh, is allowable, what type of, of uh, artwork is allowable. So you just look for those details. Um, I really, I, really want to motivate people to show their art because I know so many people, they have different professions and they're busy in their everyday lives, but they do find time to create beautiful things. If they, they maybe have a beautiful painting they created, maybe they created 20 of them or a little sculpture. And many people are very self-critical. They're saying, oh, I'm just doing it for myself as a hobby. and 
they're afraid to show their art. They are they think I'm not good enough. You know, it's just a hobby. It's not good enough. How do you know that it's good enough to actually enter this um, show? Or how do you know that you're good enough, that your art piece can be um, seen by many, many people, some art gallery? How do you get to that point with your, from where you can say okay it's my hobby I love it so much but maybe it's time for me to share with the world you know and we really need it right yes no it's I think it's important both for the audience and for the artist to display their artwork um I think uh I I can relate to that feeling of you know I don't think my artwork is good enough and you know what if they don't like it you know I I definitely have had those thoughts and those feelings uh, before which have held me back from entering anything into any kind of um, gallery. Uh, I think you just go for it, right? You look for um, a gallery that might that you think would work for your artwork and then see what what that gallery is like, how they accept um, artwork, um, and then share uh, share your artwork with them. Um, a lot of times there is a cost involved with uh, entering for to have your work displayed so that is something to keep in mind um but yeah i definitely good just good would to encourage know. you good to yeah. know yes and yeah. thank you for this encouragement i think it's important for people that's a hard step to take you know unless you have somebody who really motivates you and admires your art i think more people see your art and more positive feedback you get more confident you become and you think yes maybe there are people who enjoy it and we need to see more pieces of art I almost said beautiful pieces of art now I'm trying to switch to <laughs> my mind and start saying just art I don't know it doesn't doesn't have to be beautiful it just has to you know touch you in some way you know your emotions right so yes, no, thank you for that advice. It's it's good to know. And again, I think if you do some art, doesn't matter what form of art you're interested in, share it at least, not just with your family, maybe with friends, create um, a party, art party at home and find other friends that do maybe different type of art and do something on a small scale and then scale it up right 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 that's a, a fantastic way to go about it um and and you know you can always start building your art community that way um inviting your friends or, or family to these little art parties you might find some sort of commonalities between you and these people that you already know and and you know start building that community there Mm -hmm. And I know many people that, for example, love to paint. Uh, one of my friends, he has been painting for years. I'm just wondering where does he put all that, all those pictures? That at some point, maybe he needs to show it to the world. And you know, of course, you grow your first picture and picture like ten years later. Uh, is different not necessarily better but it's very different in terms of style and technique you learned over the years mm -hmm. I think it's a, a good idea to many artists to consider smaller uh, galleries and then maybe grow from there you meet new some new artists you make friends and you find the ways to get into this uh, larger galleries where we, we were talking about uh, different materials right and uh, then I did my research before this episode podcast episode uh, I was looking into clay and for some reason uh, in the past I thought that everything made out of clay it's kind of small not large and then I realized that terracotta warriors in China uh, they made out of clay so there's some interesting facts. Let me just uh, read it. Uh, it's very, very interesting. So in 1974, a farmer in China discovered uh, this terracotta army. So it was created over 2,000 years ago during the late 3rd century. And um, the reason 
this army was created, the emperor of China wanted to, to create an army made out of clay so they protect him in his afterlife. There are thousands of life-sized clay soldiers, horses, which is unbelievable. It took, I think, 600,000 people to create it. It just, like, then you think about it, 600,000 people, it just mind-blowing. And one of my friends uh, traveled to China and uh, he visited this uh, place where you can actually see those uh, terracotta uh, warriors and says it's mind-blowing it's unbelievable it's thousands of soldiers and each and every one of them is unique they're absolutely different and it took so many people like can you only imagine six hundred thousand people doing this it, it just it's unbelievable this is one of the places uh, that i would love to visit in my lifetime and just thinking about it it's something unbelievable and we didn't even know about it until 1974 it's like what else is undiscovered undiscovered in the world if you think about it i can imagine now finding 600,000 people and <laughs> working on the uh, clay stud, it's like it's a skill right so they had some amazing artists and also of course uh, support workers uh, but uh, amazing amazing oh i said 600,000 years uh, historical records suggest that as many as 700,000 workers were involved in the project and duration and um, they don't really know how long it took to actually uh, create it. So there's so much uh, was uh, created in the past and I feel like we're not doing as much as we used to do in the, as people used to do in the past and it comes to art and architecture and the paintings. Uh, why do you think our contemporary art is so simplistic? I think, uh people you know art changes throughout you know the centuries what is aesthetically pleasing and you know for the people at that time changes you know throughout the centuries um and i think it's just part of our issue now is probably that you know uh people are having to have their day jobs and um, are spending a lot of time doing that. And, you know, they just, they have so much going on in their lives that maybe they don't have that time to make art. Um, and, you know, I always often hear from those around me who, who admire my art, they might say to me, oh, I can never do that. And I don't think that's necessarily true. I think that they just haven't taken that step or, you know, haven't gone outside of their, their, their bubble to try. No, no, I'm looking art. at the pictures behind you. I would never, ever be able to do that. <laughs> you know, I think it can be a learned skill. I don't think, um, I don't think you could necessarily never be able to do that I, I have heard of I have heard of um uh, a member in my husband's family who uh didn't do artwork for most of her life and now she's at her older she's a, a little older and she started painting and her paintings are amazing they're very detailed very realistic photo realistic which I don't think I can do but uh, uh, you know with time and with patience and and learning she's been able to do that and I think uh, I think a lot of people can do that as long as they mm -hmm. put the effort in and you know they have the right teacher that really is inspirational a lot of times if you're working under the the right person you really are inspired just by listening to them talk and maybe their passion will inspire you and you'll learn techniques and you know everything you need all those tools that you need to create that artwork you know you'll know my dangerous. daughter my daughter used to go to art school for five years it's also in berkeley it's called monart mm -hmm. uh, mona brooks 
she has a, has schools all over the country where she can teach anyone to draw. So she technique, she can, she says anyone can draw, anyone. And then you look at the pictures, of, like my daughter was like five, six, seven. Her art was just absolutely amazing. And that's what Mona used to say. I don't know if she's teaching anymore, um, but she was teaching teachers. So her system, her art lessons are taught everywhere in the country, maybe in the world. I don't know how big they're now, um, but her idea, the concept and her vision, it's exactly about what you just said, that anyone can do it. And I really love those classes. Uh, she would turn on the music, for example, like you're somewhere in the forest and you can hear uh, birds singing and she'll teach them about birds. And then she'll teach them the technique, how to draw the bird. And every kid in the class did amazing job, just amazing job. So yes, if you have the right teachers, if you have right environments, if you're inspired and they're able to inspire you, you can do it. And as long as you put time and energy and effort, you can learn like any skills, like with music, with dance. With... But what separates like you out of all of us who doesn't do that, I think that passion for sculpture for paintings that even after a long day you know living your life and uh, taking care of things that are first priority because like you said this is <laughs> how our lives are right you still find that time instead of watching a movie uh, you're in your little studio creating something beautiful something unique you're creating something that was never created before. Right, right. Yeah, as you said, I, you know, a lot of times it is that teacher that that is inspirational. Um, and again, if you don't have that passion for art, then you might have the best teacher in the world and, you know, you just don't want to continue. <laughs> and, and so you may yeah. not um, not get that. That, uh... Just find some passion. Maybe it's not art. Maybe it's something else. But it's so important, right. I think, for every one of us to have something you're passionate about, something that is exciting to you. Definitely. Creating something that wasn't created before. I think it can have a long life, longer than human life. Right, right. And I was traveling to Rome and visiting Sistine Chapel uh, was uh, an amazing experience that I will never forget. If I close my eyes right now, I can imagine that moment, even though it happened so many years ago, because I was impressed. It's so hard to believe that the human, that human can create something like this. It's talent, but it's also hard work and dedication and so much more than just the talent. And we're not creating anything like this. I it's almost, so sad. I feel well, so sad about it. <laughs> I almost think that um, when you talk about that style of artwork, I think that's mm. what's grabbing you. That's what you really mm. like about that artwork. And that's why it's, you know, engraved in your brain. Um, yes, yes. I think, Michelangelo, yes. Right, right. I think that's, it can be a niche, right? So there's, there are artists creating that artwork, but mm. it, it may be that, you know, the aesthetic now is not necessarily that. And maybe that's why you see other artists being, you know, famous or more well-loved at, at this time. Um, mm. So maybe you're not seeing that style of artwork as much mm. but I do think that it exists and there are groups of artists that are are creating that style of artwork because mm. it is a beautiful a beautiful style but of it's artwork. not popular right so yeah that's what, like I mean. what you're saying that they're doing it but it's not popular somebody needs to right. make them known and I feel like in this uh, era when we're uh, and we have internet and uh, you can show your art to anyone in the world, I don't know how to promote them, right? Yeah, if you're saying it is there, people have these skills, they can create something on that scale. Maybe 
not exactly like that, but still something very beautiful mm-hmm. and amazing. Why are we not seeing it? It's like, again, if you we build new building, it's all glass, 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 You like white walls, glass, right. white wall, glass, beautiful. Again, we have different perception of beauty. Some of this beautiful to me, maybe not beautiful to you, but we still can agree on something that we can do better than glass and white walls. Yeah, right, maybe right. there's a place for that, but then it's all we build now. And I don't know, create right. new style, you know, 21st century style, something at some high that's... tech and, and this human touch. It's like the human touch is missing. Then we move into this high tech air, you know, I feel like that beauty, what you're creating with your hands, you know, and what we we're seeing from the history of human civilization, that handmade, unique touch, you know, those unique right. pieces, so beautiful. Yeah, I miss it. But I see what you're saying. I hear your point that um, I'm just in love <laughs> with that type of art, but it doesn't mean that we don't have uh, beautiful art created I- now. Right. I also think that artists now um, who are trying to really make it and really make a name for themselves and be at the, you know, higher levels are looking to make something new to do, to be a breakout artist, to create some style that hasn't been created before. And for that reason, they may be moving further and further away from the style you're talking about. Mm. Um, and that's just my guess no, as to why nice. we're moving so far away from it you know um it's it's artists really uh, a lot of artists are trying to really create something completely new and i do appreciate art in different forms um i do like uh, modern and contemporary art as well i really loved uh, that i traveled to chicago and uh, this uh, bean you know or they call it the cloud um, mm-hmm. s- sculpture I think it's beautiful I think it's unique and uh, amazing right maybe uh, what we can agree on it's that we need more art and different types of art and incorporating it into our architecture into our buildings into beautiful pieces we have in our house everything is so simplistic like all of a sudden became so simplistic you want something more beautiful I don't know (laughs) I don't know if it makes sense but it feels like everything is just plain yeah I think that's just an aesthetic that people like now a real clean straight Mm -hmm. lines you know (laughs) and I love it too like I love uh, in my house uh, you can see white and glass and um, but I still have some pieces that have character that long after I go, I'm gone, you know, those are little pieces that will stay with my children, maybe then grandchildren, those unique pieces of art. I like collecting it. I think it's uh, something I love to like right. having those unique pieces that I found somewhere. Then I traveled to Mexico and I bought it, it was handmade and somebody just sold it on the little uh, market. Uh, you know, I love it. Mm-hmm. I love it. And I think uh, so many people do appreciate art. And I think you made a very important point that we're making and creating art in our society after work. Right, <laughs> so right. It's not too many people can dedicate time to become a full time artist. Right. So, whatever we do after work, that's what we have, right? <laughs> yeah, I always feel like time is so limited, right? What other forms of art do you enjoy? Sometimes you might go into a gallery or a museum and see some beautiful artwork or uh, a moving piece of artwork that might inspire you to look into creating artwork in the same materials, something maybe you've never tried before. Um, I do I do really like sculpture and I do like it in, in different materials. I have um, 
Like for instance, uh, Manuel Neri creates a lot of uh, sculptures in um, plaster, which I have not done, but I really love his artwork. Um, his figures are amazing. Uh, it, his is more of one of those, um, his sculptures really uh, create that emotion. Like you might find a connection to a, a piece, even though it's not fully formed, maybe that's not the right term. It may not be fully detailed, but I, I just, I find his work so interesting. It might mm -hmm. have some portions of it that are really realistic, like uh, a leg might look like it's made of, you know, it's it's got the soft flesh, but it's plaster, but the head or the arm might be really malformed, like it's not fully mm -hmm. there. It's it's very interesting. It could partly be the material he's working with. Um, maybe that's why he works with plaster, because it dries so fast and he doesn't have the time to keep packing on oh, that maybe plaster it's his to style, finish the arm. You know, that's right, something right. I really like about uh, artists that actually can develop their signature then you right. look at the piece of art and you know exactly whose art it is and I right. think that's not easy to do and once who figured that out became incredibly famous right because it, right it, it's recognizable it's unique so it doesn't have to be perfect it's about being unique, right? Yeah, and, and following with that thought, um, there is an artist named Alberto Giacometti who I love and I admire. Um, and his artwork may be one of those that you may not call beautiful, but I feel like they're really pleasing. Um, they're full of expression and they're very simple actually. And I had first seen him in a museum. And at the time I actually have it in my sketchbook. I would take my sketchbook and sketch whatever I really liked. And his is one of those that I really liked. I sketched one of his um, draw or one of his paintings. Um, and then from that there, room, there is a beauty and simplicity too, right? Right, it right. It doesn't have to be complex to be exactly unique. Yeah. But so in, more simple it becomes, more difficult to make it unique, right? That can be true, definitely. Um, so in falling in love with just his his uh, his style of painting and and drawing, you know, I moved into another room and I realized, uh, or I saw a sculpture and I said, this looks just like Nath uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, Giacometti, and it was true. It was his sculpture. He also has some bronze casting sculptures that are amazing, and they they create the same expression and the same emotion that you find in his um, drawings mm. and, and now I can recognize his work anywhere I mean I was in a bronze casting <laughs> factory and I, I saw you know a larger than life sculpture I never thought I would see that from this artist because he only makes small sculptures but somebody created it in a larger format um, and uh, and I recognized it right away and lo and behold there was his signature so they basically took his piece and blew it up and, and mm. recast it it was beautiful uh, well in my mind it is beautiful yes yes so just to clarify you would go for bigger pieces if you had no limits uh, in terms of resources right that would be something that inspires you more and you would enjoy well, working on I want to say the reason I think I'm drawn to or would love to do larger sculptures is because I love detail. And if it's larger, it's easier to get in there and do that detail. When something is small, that detail becomes reduced and it's not quite as detailed anymore because you just can't capture that same detail in, in a, such a small space. Um, so for that reason, I do love larger sculptures. Um, or if I could create my own, whatever size I wanted, larger sculptures would probably be what I was drawn to. Um, yeah, I really like uh, marble sculptures a lot, but I, I realize how hard it is to create yeah, anything from marble. Right, it's very difficult. Um, so we were on the topic of, of uh, materials, Yeah. right? So definitely anytime I see something made out of marble, you know, I, I am in awe. Uh, with marble, sometimes the more simple the form is, 
uh, is the more difficult it is to create because oh, you're really? having, yeah, because if it's, um, if it's a form that has more dips and curves, then you, you can work that piece to have those dips and curves but if it's really smooth and straight to get marble to just be smooth and straight can be pretty difficult there's a lot of work that mm. goes into a lot of sanding and mm. going back and checking and you know um, at least that's my sort of experience secondhand experience when working um, in marble myself along with a class of you know peers who are also working in marble um, watching their work and and their style and you know, learning from them, which is one of those things that I love to do in class was watch others and listen to the instructor, instruct them. And, you know, I'd get some insight into, you know, a few things that maybe I'm not already doing, but could be doing. Absolutely. Absolutely. I can see how beneficial it is. Um, I also recently have uh, learned to make books. So I've been making little junk journals. So I, I feel like that's a form of art, maybe more of a craft, but but mm. it's enjoyable and, you know, you can make it as pretty or or not, you know, as, as you want. Um, I love that. I love that. That's uh, wonderful. Yeah. And, and, you know, also just when it comes to clay, there's all kinds of different types of clay. I have not tried them all. <laughs> there's way too many, but, uh, you know, I've had a hand in a couple here and there and, and uh, definitely I, I enjoy clay. Um, uh, painting actually for a long time, the only experience I had with painting was acrylic paint and it is uh Interesting. I, love, I love your paintings. Thank you. It is interesting to use other types of paint. Actually, this was a, an oil painting. Um, at some point uh, in the last few years, uh, I decided to try out oil painting and um, and I love it. Now, all I, most of my paintings are are oil if if that is available to me, if that's what I can do, I would prefer to do oil um, over acrylic just because you have that longer workable time. Mm. Um, you know, every material has its benefits, right? And its drawbacks. Right. Acrylic dries faster. If you have to get that painting out sooner, definitely go for acrylic because it dries faster. You can paint over your painting if you needed to. Um, and, and I like that uh, throughout our conversation today, throughout our dialogue, you always give some good advice to other people, not necessarily young artists who just start their career or you know learn how to draw but for anyone because all of us I believe that all of us have a creative side that uh, we want to explore you know so what would you recommend uh, new artists of any age where to start if you feel like you know, I always wanted to learn how to paint or I always wanted to uh, create a little sculpture. But where do I even start? Especially for older people, for kids, right. you know, there's so many options. You can find uh, some club for kids. You can sign them up for art class. There are a lot of uh, options out there for adults. Um, I don't want to minimize that and say that there aren't. Um, mm -hmm. It's just, they may be different. Uh, I would suggest uh, taking a class, but I do understand that some people might be intimidated. They might think, oh, everybody in that class might be better. And, you know, I, I don't know that I can uh, feel comfortable in that setting. And I would say, you know, take the chance and just do it. You'll find you'll connect with people there. And it's really great working in a setting when there's other artists working at the same time. It motivates you, inspires you to keep going. Um, but if you can't do that, um, you know, not everybody There are probably can do some that. community college classes too. Exactly. It's, exactly. That's probably the yes. way to go. The, the community the, colleges are great. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. The other option um, or Another option. There's a lot of options. Another That's option good. would be. I'm so glad to hear that. Yeah. Another option would be to go online. You can watch a YouTube and learn from start there, you know, learn the basics. And then if once you feel comfortable, go take that class in person. 
Um, and then, you know, small art communities within local, you know, your local city might already have small courses here and there. Um, you know, our local gallery has a, a Sunday class where, you know, there is an artist there teaching, you know, something that they're really good at or they know how to do. And you can take what you learn from them and, you know, build on it, mm -hmm. take several classes. Um, and there's also all these, you know, I uh, like the master classes that you can take. So you just, you know, purchase that class and you take it from your the comfort of your own home and follow the instruction and, and start mm -hmm. your learning there. That's always and there are probably some one on one classes, too, because sometimes, right. you know, people work and they have specific schedule. They need to pick up kids from school. They're working late. So uh, the time for a specific class may not always work for them. So maybe uh, there's some individual uh, opportunities, classes, one-on-one -on -one classes. Oh, I, know, oh. I know that YouTube classes can be beneficial and this is kind of a starting point, but when it comes to art, you want to have hands-on experience right there, live, right? Yeah, it always is nice to get some creativity critique like criticism of your work so you know where you can grow and where to build and you know where you're doing well um so definitely it, it is nice to have someone to connect with that can guide you um i'm sure um that there are some virtual versions of that where you can connect with the teacher i feel like that's often the norm with uh let's say music lessons you can yeah. do that virtually i'm sure there's artists out there that would do that virtually so another great way for uh, an upcoming artist or a, a person want, wanting to learn how to make art um, and to be inspired is to follow them on Instagram or any social media. So I found that following um, artists that inspire me or that I just enjoy looking at their artwork, I'll follow them on Instagram. And oftentimes they show their process, which is, you know, educational for me. If it's something that- And you that do I'm... too. You do right. too. So I definitely share that on my Instagram. If anybody's interested, I'm at Patty Sobin Arts. Um, and yeah, I definitely answer questions on there. And I find that other artists do that as well. So definitely f feel free to start there and learn about processes there to see if there's something that really uh, calls to you that you think would yeah, be really like joining this community mm -hmm. can be very inspiring yeah, and kind of can trigger your way into a creative process. Correct. That is wonderful. And I noticed that in the last several months, probably in the last six months, there had been a lot of AI generated art created. So what do you think about that? It's interesting. Um, definitely something I, I haven't actually tried too much. I, 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 did, I did and I loved it. It's really exciting. You can just describe in details you know, what you want to create and it creates it in different styles and in seconds, this is mind blowing. Then I was thinking about AI and technology accelerating, you know, I thought, okay, maybe some of the jobs like working in McDonald's uh, will be taken over by robots and technology will improve the processes, automating things. And people will finally find time to be creative so they don't have to create art after work, you know? So they can finally uh, dedicate time to careers that they really love. Um, nobody enjoys, you know, flipping burgers in McDonald's. Maybe somebody does, but most people don't. It's a hard work, not very rewarding and not really uh, paid well. So yes, if you... If technology takes over, you know, we automate things and uh, people can create more art, that's wonderful. Uh, but then I found that ChatGPT uh, can create a beautiful poem and uh, other AI tools can create art in seconds. So what's going to happen to our traditional art? <laughs> what do you think? Well, I feel like even with AI, there's there's a... Uh, fine-tuning that you have to learn on how to word 
you know, what you're putting into chat GPT. Um, I've noticed, you know, a lot of times when I'm looking at that artwork, you could kind of tell that it's AI. Um, I do think that it will get that, better, though. It will I, I improve. agree. It's, just it's the technology. First stage. That's yeah. what happens <laughs> with technology. Um, I do think that there will be a big subset of people that will be drawn to that sort of art and will be drawn to purchase, you know, items with that sort of art on there. Um, and I agree with, or I assume I agree with you <laughs> that it, it might hurt some of the um, actual hands-on artists, but I do also think that there's a, a group of people that love that handmade style, love that, love to learn about the artists and the art, why they created it. Like a lot of times I've purchased art from other artists and I like to know who they are and why they made this piece, why did they why they even started with that style. A lot of a lot of times that backstory is what makes you love that piece even more. And AI doesn't quite have that backstory. It doesn't Absolutely. quite have Absolutely. that hands-on feel. Yes, yes. I actually think that handmade art will become even more valuable because less people will start to learn those skills. So they become more valuable and handmade like everything handmade right will become more expensive more valuable and again yes i i agree with you 100 percent that when you buy a piece of art it's not only about the art but it's also about the artist you know who this right. artist is you know why that why did he create this art what did he feel in the moment you know the emotion behind it means a lot yes but it just like with words uh, it's not what you said but who said that can make a huge difference same thing with art if it's made by AI in seconds it may be beautiful it can be useful for certain um, maybe for some uh, advertisement or somebody wants to put it on the wall in their uh, bedroom it's fine and they think I created it um, you know it's a form of art that has its place right in the spectrum of art available right. in the universe <laughs> but at the same time I think it, it will never ever replace handmade art and paintings like okay maybe if they create a robot who can create a painting and it will look like uh, it's created by human right and they would uh, kind of program him to generate art that can you know based on some emotion human emotion more the artificial intelligence learns about humans or maybe it still will be hard to see is this human made or it's artificial intelligent generated art mm -hmm. unless you go to the museum and you know they say they verified you know it's verified made by this person right then you're buying and you know wow this uh, this person uh, spent hours of their life to create this art and you love it, you enjoy it, and if you want to purchase it too, if it's for sale, right, you know it was created by this person in this uh, year. But really, a lot of art now, if you look at the real art or AI art, sometimes it's hard to understand it. That was it created by human or was it created by AI? And it's just the beginning, so it will become more beautiful, over time you know and more and harder to see the difference between human made and ai generated and of course even i'm not even touching on the copyright issue related to this ai art it's completely different conversation but i still believe that uh, you cannot replace handmade art and there's so much value in it and it will just go up if there's an artist with his unique style, you know, right. which is recognizable and 
that person spend a lot of time and energy creating that art it will always have value in my mind in my well, mind yes i think hand making items is also valuable to the artist i mean uh you really get yourself into a mindset of creating and and it's really beneficial you know to to you and your well-being being to have the that creativity and have that moment sometimes you know that artwork could be relaxing for you and it may be something you need if you have a fast-paced you know career um, to have that time to slow down and do something that's really creative. And I love so. this point. I really love it because you're saying it's not only about the final product. It's about the it's process. Like process. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. No, that, that's a very good point. I love it. But from the perspective of the just general public, right? And they look at different art and uh, kind of evaluating it looking at the handmade art and AI generated art. And then it's hard to see um, and hard to understand if it was a handmade or not. In some point, we won't be able to see the difference until, unless you see the artist doing it, you know, in their studio, uh, you wouldn't know who created it. If it was a robot program to paint that painting was it ai generated or if it's a human made product mm -hmm. i don't know even now for for artists it's so hard to survive just to be a, a painter full time but how about how does it affect the future of artist uh, painter as a profession well, I am kind of interested to see, will AI art end up in galleries? Is that something mm. that will happen in the future? I can't, I can't envision that right now, but uh, who knows what the, the future holds. Yeah. Yeah, and that's interesting. Uh, the world is moving in a fast pace. Mm -hmm. in terms of automation, um, artificial intelligence. And as I said, I was, uh, I worked in the discovery field and uh, we were using machine learning and artificial intelligence for many, many years for different purpose for identifying evidence in the data set. But I never worried about uh, art or poetry be affected by AI. Mm -hmm. But now I'm thinking about it, and it's interesting to to see what happens in the future. Definitely, same thing with music. If it was generated by artificial intelligence, of course, uh, it can be perfect. But again, the beauty of art isn't it the imperfection, right? The beauty mm -hmm. of art is in this human touch. And again, like you said, if it, if the music was generated by AI and the music at the concert where you have a band playing live, they don't even sound like they sound on the radio, right? It's so different. It's uh, not as good, but it's so much better because the energy, the vibe, mm -hmm. everything, and the person who created that and the singer and their voice live, it's like, it doesn't have to be perfect to be wonderful. That's what people right. want. So I think the AI art, AI music, it has its place, but just it just has its place. It's not going to uh, replace human-made art, music, right. pictures. So we're talking about AI as a tool, but artists has been using so many different applications for digital art and a kind of mix of using technology and their personal skills that takes years to develop, right? To become a good artist. 
Yeah, definitely. So um, one of the other skills that I've been working on um, uh, and another material, I guess you can call it, that I've been using is um, illustrating on on a computer, I should say, the digital drawings. Um, so one of the drawings I wanted to point out was this one here on my Aww, shirt. That's, that's uh, so I love it. This I is... want this t-shirt. <laughs> where, where can I get it? I want to buy this one. You can definitely get one of these for yourself at, uh, at my website. Um, mm. I'm at www.pattysobinarts.com um, I have a little section there with uh, different illustrations that I've come up with that are on t-shirts and on mugs and cups so you actually and... draw but uh, like a digital art digital art yes so I I, actually, I hand draw all of them um, and this these drawings this is not are... AI generated this is no generated. not AI <laughs> this is actually art I based on uh, one of my dogs that I had that uh, we adopted when she was older. She was 14. We had her for two years. Um, so she actually did have a banana bed. And Aww. so, you know, she, she would lay in it. Oh, this so, is super so, uh, cute. I love it. Just a reminder. And, you know. Yeah. Do you have any other ones there? Yeah, definitely. I have You'll a few others. More. Yeah. And I, I just continually add. So definitely, if you are interested, Go oh, ahead I love and check it out. Keep type looking. Of t-shirts. Mm -hmm. That is so cute. I love it. Very you. unique. You can't find it anywhere. So that's good. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. But let's get back to clay. <laughs> I think then we talk about clay. People usually uh, think about uh, taking kids to clay classes, uh, which is good and very beneficial. I remember I did even a birthday party for my son. And so a lot of kids came and they all were playing with clay. So the kids were creating cups uh, using pottery. Well, they had so much fun. It's amazing. And I tried uh, creating a vase and the pottery went, that was amazing. Like I would never forget and I have to do it again. And I loved it. I loved every moment of it. It was amazing. And I think every person in the world, and then they think about pottery will, um, what comes to mind, to everyone's mind is a, a movie ghost with Damien. Yes, Moore. that famous scene. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, pottery or creating pottery on the wheel, to me, looks very relaxing. Like it, it's just the feel of the clay and, you know, getting that form that you are trying to 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 create um especially i know you said the vase and it's all about those curves and everything right which is you know fantastic um i will say that i do often get that question of you know when i tell people i work with clay i work in ceramic they tend to think oh so you make pottery you, you make um. bowls and cups and vase actually i i don't um i mainly i make sculpture I don't, I haven't really had the opportunity to use a pottery wheel. It does look really fun. I am actually. Oh, you in should the, get, the, you should get the, one. Yes. And so I, I, I think, <laughs> I feel like everyone should get, have a, a pottery wheel uh, somewhere, <laughs> at least somewhere in the garage, you know, for couples. <laughs> yes. No, I am actively thinking of uh, purchasing like you, one. You're, have too, you're too stressed today. You had a difficult <laughs> day. Let's go spin the wheel. <laughs> right <laughs> you're gonna yeah. come to somebody's house and they have like you know a collection a collection yeah. <laughs> of vase like yeah this this couple <laughs> yeah I'm <laughs> I am hoping I am hoping to get a wheel soon and you know practice that I think it's a beautiful art form and especially because you're creating functional art and I think that's really great not just to have art that you look at but art that you use so um definitely if I could eat off of these beautiful plates that have you know my artwork that would be amazing so I yeah. do look forward to doing that at some point and hopefully sooner than later but thank you for mm, yes I think I think it's all <laughs> about marketing I don't understand why it's not widely common Every, I feel like everyone should have a pottery wheel in their house it's really it's so relaxing right now everyone talks about okay meditation and all these uh, things uh, to help people with their 
mental health uh, right. because there's so much stress uh, not only in people's perf- personal lives but with everything what's going on in the world uh, right. I feel like we need to promote like sports not like oh let's go to the gym but something like let's go play tennis or go on a bike ride something that is natural same thing with uh, pottery wheel I feel like creating something with your hands and it's such a uh, relaxing experience right I think it's it's very good and especially like for couples if if you google uh, clay classes or uh, pottery wheels for couples it there are some classes for couples like that so they can go and experience it you know and everyone is uh, feeling uh, romantic but those studios they don't really create couples experience like why do, doesn't someone open the little pottery studio where it will be dim light and some candles and red wine and here's your ex- pottery will experience for a couple and doesn't have to be expensive and I don't know it just people need to be more creative to to make those experiences available for everyone like of course as I'm joking saying everyone should have a party (laughs) in their house but it should be something like okay let's go make a waste together (laughs) my love you know (laughs) I think it sounds like a a great date experience (laughs) great date experience exactly exactly why not yes Oh, now I remember the fact that, you know, with uh, podcasts, that there are not too many ladies uh, participating in podcasts, like that's such a, an issue that I'm thinking, I'm thinking about it a lot. I have a, a couple of my favorite podcasts and they're just men, men, men. And the podcast hosts, I don't think they do it intentionally. I think just women generally don't want to participate in podcasts like you i want to encourage uh, more women more ladies more young ladies and ladies of any age uh, to participate in podcasts it, it's been on my mind like i wanted to thank you now even behind this scene for your bravery you know and for sharing your thoughts your ideas and inspiring uh, so many people whoever will be watching it that to me, it's like extremely important. I'm so grateful that you agreed to do that because I also have some good friends that have amazing stories or achieved so much in their careers. And if they come and they talk about it, and even if one person listens and it would make change their life or inspire them, you know, or make them wake up and do something different because of that interview that's amazing but they're like no not comfortable just like Mm -hmm. eh, you know more private what if I say something and say thank you for doing it so I would like to say thank you so much for joining us today thank you for your time thank you for your great advice thank you for all the art that you're creating And thank you for sharing your experiences with us. Thank you. Yes, thank you for having me, Christina. This has been so fun and it's really great to speak to a woman on a podcast. It's, you know, so great. Thank you for doing this and thank you for asking me on. Thank you. Yes, uh, you're right. There's uh, so many wonderful podcasts and we need more women participating in this podcast and share their life stories, experiences, and inspire other ladies. Agreed. Thank you. Thank mm-hmm. you.